Before we started talking on camera, you, you talked about body camera legislation that you introduced mm -hmm. and uh, very specifically to uh, Peoria, obviously the, the city has had a couple of uh, deadly police involved shootings mm -hmm. just in September and one of the, the recurring conversations as a result of, of those shootings that comes up is, you know, what about body cameras? Yes. Why are there no body cameras? Mm -hmm. uh, so part of the, the uh, issue of, of body cameras is that it wasn't something that was uh, part of policing in Illinois, and and I think you can better explain mm -hmm. uh, what, why that, how that ties into the legislation that, that you sponsored. So um, May 14, 2014, I introduced the first body camera bill um, in Illinois. We passed that bill um, a little bit more than a year later. When I introduced the bill in 2014, that was prior to. Uh, Mike Brown, that was prior to um, I Can't Breathe, that was prior to um, Alton Sterling. So it was prior to these national incidents between community and police blowing up and then becoming um, sort of these rally cries around the country. So I introduced the bill simply because working with law enforcement, um, we had come to the to the belief that the reality of it is the body camera is really going to be law enforcement's best opportunity at being able to preserve the relationship between police and community. Because for years, right, for years, I've heard stories, we've all heard stories about interactions between um, citizens and police and them not going over so well. Sometimes those stories were probably true, maybe sometimes they weren't. There was a particular law enforcement uh, officer from downstate Illinois who had indicated to me, who was very supportive and did one of the first press conferences back in 2014, he said, thank God, because they were test piloting, even all the way back then, a body camera operation. He said, thank God I had that body camera, because I probably would have lost my job if I didn't, because I had a false accusation made against me, and the body camera sort of exonerated me. Speaking specifically to the city of Peoria, I don't know why locally it has not been more of a priority. At the end of the day, the body cameras are fairly inexpensive. What I will say, that is expensive is um, being able to preserve all of the data in a cloud, right? And so when we structure the legislation, if the film has not been flagged within 30 days, you can recycle that space. Um, I know that finances are always in, you know, always going to be an issue anytime you are living in a city that's one of the fastest shrinking cities in the country that means we're losing tax revenue as well so revenues are always going to be a bit challenged but i think that we just have to ask ourselves the question what's a priority and to me it is a priority that we have body cameras now as it comes to um, crafting budgets the city council then has to make the decision sometimes you have to choose well this goes and this stays or those are the kinds of decisions that we all have to make as a part of our budget making process. We have to do it, I have to do that as well. So it's not like you just get to choose whatever you wanna do. There may be some other things that have to go. I'm not on the city council, so I don't know what that specific decision would be. But I do think that in the interest of preserving the relationship between community and police, because it's so critical, it's so critical to, um, to having a thriving community I think it's worth the investment. I absolutely think it's worth the investment. When we passed the legislation in 2015, we created um, a grant program so that communities that could not foot the bill, most communities in Illinois, their police force is not as big as the city of Peoria. You may have a dozen, a dozen and a half cities in Peoria that have police forces over 10 people. Um, but most of, literally most police forces in this state maybe have five, six, seven, eight police officers. So those communities oftentimes have a very challenging time putting together the resources to invest in a program. But even a city like the city of Peoria, the size of the city of Peoria could make a grant application to the Law Enforcement Standards and Training Board to receive resources that would help offset the cost of investing in a body camera program. I long for the day that they make that investment. Uh, you mentioned a little bit earlier that one of the, the, the best things that Governor Rauner has uh, invested himself in is criminal justice reform. It's, it's an issue really nationwide that has brought Democrats and Republicans together, even at the highest levels. Uh, 
it's something that Dick Durbin and, and Chuck Grassley mm -hmm. are working on at the federal level. Uh, what, what's next at the state level in terms of, of criminal justice reform? I think the, reform? Next, the next biggest uh, front for us as a state as it relates to criminal justice reform will likely be um, taxation and regulation of marijuana. I think that there is a, there's an economic conversation that has to be had in that space, but there's also a conversation around um, justice reform, right? So for years you've had men and women, predom uh, predominantly of people of color, that have part, you know, partaken in what was then an illegal activity. Uh, it is still illegal, but as we are beginning to have these conversations, I mean, Governor Rauner, obviously, he is um, not uh, in favor of marijuana legalization, but J.B. Pritzker very comfortably talks in that space, no matter where he's at in the state, you know? I mean, some communities are more conservative than others, but he comfortably has that conversation, which lets me know that um, it is going to be high on their radar. There are 17 other states um, around the United States of America right now that are either strongly considering this legislation or legislation is feverishly moving um, through the state. I think that as we begin to have conversations about how we deal with um, some of our pension issues, um, our economic situation, I do think that we're going to have to look at alternative revenue sources um, as a state. This is likely going to be a conversation that we're going to continue in 2019 if J.B. Pritzker wins in November. And some Republicans seem to already be on board as well. Some members of the Republic of the governor's party are in support of oh. some kind of regulation for oh, yes. marijuana uh, legalization. Jason Berkman, who's just over in Bloomington, he's in our media market. He is a pro, I don't know if he's a sponsor, a, a sponsor on the bill, but I know that he's a proponent. He's vocal. There are Republican members also in the House that are, um, I don't know, again, I don't know if they're, um, co-sponsors, but they certainly, they support it, and they support it very vocally. And so that is why I believe that this is a real conversation. I brought um, the sponsors uh, to our community back in March because I feel like I want, I want Peoria to be able to have input in this space. It's something that's probably going to happen, even if it doesn't happen in 2019, which I think it will. But even if it doesn't happen in 2019, it's not that far off, so we need to have conversations about what makes sense for us as a state, what makes sense for us as a community, but certainly when you look at it from the lens of criminal justice reform and you look at, you know, there are people all over this country that are literally getting rich um, because of their involvement with uh, recreational marijuana. At the very same time, you have people sitting in penitentiaries, jails, and if nothing less, they have dings on their record that prevent them from being gainfully employed because of something that we're now talking about making legal. I think that um, that is for sure going to be the next big uh, criminal justice piece that we're going to tackle here in Illinois. Uh, the speaker hasn't necessarily been 100% on board with it, mm -hmm. so that's one part. The other part, what are you hearing from local law enforcement? Um, the speaker's, contrary to popular belief, he's pretty conservative. I mean, the speaker is a 75-year-old um, Cauc Caucasian Irish man who was raised on the southwest side of Chicago who primarily went to parochial schools. The speaker is very conservative. You know, I know people think that he's this, whatever they think he is, but he's very conservative. And so... Um, he has not checked my pulse about the issue. <laughs> uh, he hasn't asked me my thoughts on it, but my guess is that he would probably line up with most 75-year-old men, and it's just something that they, you know, have grown to view in a particular way, but I don't know. You know, I, I really don't know where he is on that issue. The kind of person that the speaker is, he sits back, he assesses the situation, he pulls in lots of information, and he makes a decision, and I assume that, like many other issues, he will do that with this. As, as it relates to law enforcement, I'm gonna be honest with you, I don't think that law enforcement, as a larger body, is probably ever going to be in support of um, 
legalization of recreational uh, marijuana. But when you talk to individual officers, it's a different situation. And so um, I have talked to local law enforcement members, not as, you know, in their official capacity as a officer, but just as a, another citizen in the community. There are many officers that I've talked to that support the concept. Lastly, as this interview airs, you just had an expungement seminar. If somebody's interested in taking advantage of something like that, what's the best way to go about it? You know what, the best thing for them to do is to please call, contact our office. Uh, the number of my office is area code 309-681-1992. If you didn't have a pen, go grab a pen. It's 681-1992. They should just call our office and um, get on the waiting list for the next expungement summit. It is, we always, have, we always have a waiting list in this community because there are a lot of people who need second chances and we're just honored to be able to work in this space and be able to bring people those second chances to take care of themselves and take care of their families. All right, State Representative Jahan Gordon Booth, thank you so much for being so generous with your time. Well, listen, I, before we go, I want to thank you for being um, an amazing asset to this community. I know that you're leaving us very soon, which breaks my heart, but I'm also happy for you at the same time because your family is growing. Um, but you have been, you've been phenomenal, and I want you to know how much I appreciate you, but also the veteran community. I don't know if many folks know, but I host a veterans uh, breakfast every year, and Paul is like literally always the first one <laughs> in the door and always the last one to leave, cleaning up, getting coffee, running back and getting syrup or butter for the pancakes. And the veterans in this community and their spouses and their families, they love talking with people like yourself who they see in their homes um, every evening, every afternoon. And so I just wanna really thank you from the bottom of my heart because it's folks like you that when we put these things together that really make it come to life. And sometimes I just sit back and I watch how people respond to you and you're so genuine, you're so genuine. I'm not surprised that you're having success in your career because that kind of authenticity transfers to every area of life. So thank you for being a great asset well, thank to Peoria. You. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks. It wouldn't be possible to do that without you and, and what you do for the veterans anyway. So appreciate it. I appreciate you having me and thank you for being here. Thanks.